Welcome to the BioBalance HealthCast, episode number 515, Lowered Risk of Invasive Breast Cancer with Testosterone Implants. BioBalance Health features conversations about anti-aging medicine. Your hosts are Dr. Kathy Maupin, Medical Director of BioBalance Health and a leading expert in treating symptoms of aging, and Brett Newcomb, a licensed professional counselor. Dr. Maupin and Brett are the authors of The Secret Female Hormone, the seminal work about testosterone replacement therapy for women, and Got Testosterone, the newly released book for men that helps men choose the most effective and safe form of T replacement. These books are available on Amazon or from Dr. Maupin's office at BioBalance Health in St. Louis and in Kansas City. Dr. Maupin's office is currently accepting new patients. There's a lot of research that is constantly being done around the topic of breast cancer. It's a frightening and deadly disease, and many women have died from it. One in eight women are at risk of getting it at some point in their life in North America. So doctors and patients are constantly worried about what can we do? Is there something that we can do that we know that works to help avoid the risk or lower the risk of invasive breast cancer? And they've found certain genetic components that, that some women are more at risk if they have these genes than other women who don't have these genes. And they've found other treatments that they try to use. They recommend things like diet, you know, you stop smoking, watch your drinking, exercise, all, all the standard good health prescriptions. But Recently, a doctor who named Rebecca Glaser, who works in Ohio and does research with people around the world, and has written any number of really good recent clinical studies, produced a study uh, of some research that she did on the incident of invasive breast cancer when women are treated with testosterone implants. And she makes the distinction in the, re- in the research mm-hmm. between orally delivered testosterone versus testosterone that's a micronized pellet that's implanted in the fat tissue of the hip. And so today we want to talk about the study that she produced and the results that she got in her study because it really makes the case for the treatment protocols at BioBalance Health being on track with the most current research. So that's what we want to talk about today. So... Rebecca Glazer uses non-micronized uh, testosterone in her mm-hmm. pellets. So mm-hmm. that that's a distinction. That is what makes, we use non-micronized testosterone in the pellets. So that is a safer pellet than the pellets that are micronized. But she, she always puts that distinction in her studies. And she has studies on several different subjects, but multiple studies on breast cancer and testosterone. So she, she notes that testosterone pellets have been around 80 years. We talk about that. They've been using them in women for 80 years for, for treatment of hormone imbalances, not mm-hmm. for the treatment of breast cancer, but for treatment of hormone imbalances. Mm-hmm. She wanted to take that, which is not a new cutting edge frontline thing, the mm-hmm. way we sometimes think it is because so many doctors ignore it and don't recommend it. FDA don't know anything about it. The, the FDA doesn't even recognize women need that, testosterone. Yeah, but she said they've been giving women testosterone pellets implanted in their skin for more than 80 mm-hmm. years. And she wants to look at the data and see what if we, if we did that, what would be the impact, if anything, that's measurable on breast cancer. So she started in 2008. Right. She did a double, uh, a prospective cohort study, which is, a, is a, a study that you can depend on for its outcome. And uh, the study ended, um, or the first part of the study ended in 2013, and as of 2018, because they followed many of these patients for that entire time, uh, they found that if patients were taking testosterone pellets, the incidence of breast cancer, of invasive breast cancer, was 11 out of their 1,200-some 1, patients. 1,267. 1,267 patients. But if they took nothing, the, the sample that took nothing had 18 cases in the same number of patients. So that that ends up being measured. A 35% reduction yeah. in risk factors. Right, and and when we look at it, like everybody says, cases per 100,000. So that means that's 165 cases per 100,000 women, and normally it's 271 cases 
per 100,000 women. So that's how we kind of show the difference on a scale that everybody talks Standard. Standard. Standard reference they use point. It. All right. So that's a big difference. I mean, and that's not something that has been 35% discussed reduction. in mainstream medicine. Right. A third is huge. So in the in the research paper itself, there's a lot of discussion of the components, the elements. How do we bring this together? How do we narrow our focus? Why do we focus on this? And one of the things that Dr. Glazer talks about is that testosterone implants, we now know, based on the results of the study, 35% reduced risk factor. But she talks about the interplay between testosterone and estrogen mm -hmm. and estrogen receptors mm -hmm. in the breast. So right. you talk about that all the mm -hmm. time as well in the, in the work that I've heard, seen you do. Can you explain what she's looking at? Because she, she mentions uh, an estrozole. Mm -hmm. uh, and A medication that lowers estrone and lowers estrogen in the, in the circulation, but also lowers the ability of estrogens to attach to the receptor sites in breast cancers. Mm -hmm. So I have to go back to say that when you have a breast cancer, you have an abnormal cell. The abnormal cell isn't like the rest of your breast. It has usually has many more estrogen receptors and, uh, on the cancer, and it stimulates the activity and growth of that cancer more than it would do to a normal breast cell. So when... When you have estrogen and you don't have breast cancer, it doesn't cause breast cancer. It just, if you already had it, there's a lot of receptors there. It can make it grow. Because the receptor cells recognize the cancer the same way they would recognize the testosterone or the estrogen. Okay, so then, then there's, a, there's a, these receptors are multi-hormonal. So okay. they, they, the receptor for estrogen also is a receptor for testosterone. So the, the um, studies show that when you give testosterone, it acts especially at a higher dose than is physiologic, that you can, then you can make it yourself. It competes with the estrogen, and it actually displaces the estrogen on those receptor sites. So the estrogen <clears throat> isn't stimulating the cancer as much. So, so Dr. Glazer talks about for the last 70 years, they have known about the relationship between testosterone and estrogen mm -hmm. in the breast. Mm -hmm. And she said that there are some studies in the literature from years back mm -hmm. that say there's a correlation between giving women testosterone mm -hmm. or women who have high testosterone mm -hmm. registries in mm -hmm. their blood and their incidence of blood cancer. So then breast she, cancer. I'm sorry, breast cancer. Mm -hmm. But then she makes the case correlation is not causation. Right. Just they, correlation means they happen simultaneously. They happen together. You see them connected. They happen but, to be on testosterone and they got breast cancer. Right. So I always tell my patients, we're going to give you testosterone, but but that that isn't going to stop you from always getting breast cancer. It's not going to prevent it 100% of the time because you can see that 11 of the 1,200-something patients still got breast cancer. But there would have been seven more if they hadn't been on testosterone. So it does prevent some of the breast cancer. When she makes two sub points about that in her discussion, mm -hmm. she said one is the obesity insulin factor. She right. said all of the studies that identified the correlation between breast cancer and testosterone mm -hmm. did not account for obesity and insulin reactions within the, within the breast. Mm -hmm. And she said, you have to factor that out. You have to see, is this caused by what? Is it caused by obesity? Mm -hmm. you know, or is it caused by testosterone, which it's not? Which, which is part of the conclusion mm -hmm. they came to. Mm -hmm. But she makes the point that obesity is a risk factor in and of itself for breast cancer. Mm -hmm. If you are obese, you are more likely to get breast cancer than women who are not obese. The more fat you have... The more estrogen you make, and estrone, not the, not the good estrogen, the bad, the estrone is the old lady estrogen that usually comes from the adrenal, but can also be made, made in your fat, and it then gets into your circulation and stimulates breast growth, and if you have a cancer, it stimulates the cancer to grow quickly. So, so she makes one additional point mm -hmm. with, when she talks about the obesity insulin factor. She also says in the past... These studies did not distinguish between free testosterone and total testosterone, 
which is something that you talk about mm-hmm. all the time. Mm-hmm. And maybe it would be a good reference to bring back that conversation. Mm-hmm. So both in men and women, when we look at how much testosterone you, you are either you make in your body, your mm-hmm. total testosterone that's in your circulation, um, that means that's how much is made in your body. But it doesn't mean that's how much is active because we have no place to store testosterone. We store it in the blood. So the way we store it is a protein sticks onto the, te- the testosterone and keeps it from working. And so that's storage only if you have a blood loss or some other reason you need more free testosterone because of some disaster, then your body will release more to work because you've lost blood and lost testosterone. Mm -hmm. However, testosterone free has no protein on it and it sticks to the receptor sites. So it makes the cells work. When when the, the free testosterone sticks to the receptor site, it goes into the cell and activates the nucleus. So when you get a blood test to measure your testosterone, The critical number that you're looking for is free testosterone that's identified, not total testosterone. Right. And and the other thing to remember is even if you get your free testosterone, you and your neighbor and your cousin and your mother are not going to need the same amount of free testosterone because you have a genetic difference in the number of receptor sites and the activity of them. So it's very complex. It's not just, oh, you have this much testosterone, so you need it. Mm-hmm. Even though we use that as a baseline for how we decide, we can't measure t- receptor sites. Receptor sites on not just cancer cells, all your cells. So if you have a lot of very sensitive receptor sites, you don't need a lot of free testosterone. Mm-hmm. But if you've got resistant receptor sites genetically, or as we get older, they become more resistant, you need a lot of testosterone to try to flood those receptor sites and make them work. Right. We also, if you have resistant receptor sites, we also try to lower the estrogen so the competition doesn't put estrogen onto those receptor sites. Well, and testosterone will sometimes convert into estrogen. Right. And and that's a genetic thing too. So, and we look at estrone levels usually to see if somebody's converting their so testosterone. So estrone is one of two types of estrogen, mm-hmm. estrile, estradiol. Estriol. Estradiol. Estradiol. Yeah. Diol yeah. Is, is E2, which is young women's estrogen. Okay. What you said was est- estriol estrone. is a byproduct of both estrone and estradiol. And, estradiol. and there's not very much in the blood. Mm-hmm. It's really a byproduct and it goes out your kidney, but it's a primary hormone of pregnancy. So, but we, we look at estrone and estradiol. Estradiol, the young woman's estrogen, estrone, the old lady estrogen that they both compete with testosterone, but estrone does more damage, increases your belly fat, increases your breast size, increases a lot of the things that we view as what people Dangerous. look like when they're old and how they get sick and, yeah. and their precursors to getting sick. So in her discussion, she says in order to inhibit that conversion of testosterone to estrogen, mm-hmm. they add an estrazole. Right. Which also is an aromatase, aromatase, which is an aromatase inhibitor. Yes. And that does what in the breast? So that does, uh, an aromatase inhibitor stops the conversion of testosterone into estrogen. Okay. So it, it takes that enzyme, aromatase enzyme, and it blocks it. It doesn't always block all of it. We use it to treat uh, breast cancer in women because we don't want, that are estrogen receptor positive. We don't want to have a lot of extra estrogen. Mm-hmm. So we use it for that. We use it in men for breast cancer. Males get breast cancer too. We use it in men who have gynecomastia, which is like man breasts. So mm-hmm. we use it in that so that that will shrink the, the man breasts okay. because in general, they're not, they don't make estrogen in their uh, testicle. They make their estrogens in their, uh, uh, they make it in their fat okay. and in the breast tissue. So we're trying to just go to the go to the uh, periphery and stop that conversion of testosterone into estrogen, so that the man boobs. So go within away. within the breast, for women especially, mm-hmm. you want to reduce or block the number of estrogen receptor sites mm-hmm. because the estrogen will can bond with a, the cancer cells, or right? Can stimulate cancer them. cells to make the the cancer grow. And so they grow faster. Mm -hmm. So you want to make sure those receptor sites are not available to the cancer cell. Mm -hmm. One of the ways to do that, we now know because of this study, Mm -hmm. is to put enough testosterone in there. And to block the the level of estrogen. With the uh, anastrozole or the Arimidex, the receptor sites. And she did it like I do. She put the anastrozole in the pellet. 
So explain, because she goes to an elaborate description of what pellets she uses and why mm -hmm. she uses them, and where they're made, how they're made, all that kind of stuff. And, and when we were discussing the research, you said, well, that's exactly what we do. Mm -hmm. So explain what you do for your pellets. So our, our pellets are um, the same. Far we, it's important to know your pharmacy. It's the mm -hmm. same pharmacy that we've used. Two pharmacies we've used for the, the uh, 18 years that we've, been, that we've been doing this. And it's also, we also have to have um, pure powder that is compressed at a certain pressure into a certain size that has a surface area that's consistent every single time so that when we put the pellets in, they dissolve at the same rate uh -huh. uh, per individual. So we can count on their pellets going away at the same amount of time and getting the same blood dose or blood level each time. So when we need an astrozole plus, plus the testosterone pellet, we have 10 milligrams of an astrozole powder put in with, 10, with 90 of testosterone and that combination then goes in one pellet and so sometimes we use two of them in men we often use three uh, with a lot of other just pure testosterone so we figure out the dose based on how much estrone and estradiol they have mm -hmm. how much they've converted how much fat they have on them how much lean body mass they have and then we decide how much they need for women we usually don't need more than one 90 milligram testosterone and one 10 milligram uh, anastrozole, plus maybe one or one and a half more pellets of testosterone pure. So but that does it. That stops it. I mean, I'm one of those genetically. I make a my anastros or my uh, aromatase enzyme is very active, and when I started taking pellets. I felt great for the first month, and then all of a sudden I started making all this estrone, and I kind of went, <sighs> and I mean, it was it was not a pretty sight. So I talked to the doctor that was training me, and I said, so what did we, what happened here? Yeah. And he said, oh yeah, you're Italian. Most Italians have, make a lot of estrone. Yeah. So he said, you just need to, he, at first, then he told me to take oral Arimidex, which gives you kind of a, an um, arthritis kind of feeling. But now we put it in the pellet, and that's much better. You don't have any arthritis with that. So, so it's preferable to taking it orally. Okay. And in the end, it's cheaper because the, the, you're going to get the pellets anyway. We just add a little medicine to them. Mm -hmm. So that, to me, is ideal for preventing breast cancer. But just testosterone alone prevents breast cancer by filling up the receptor sites. So, so if I'm understanding correctly, what you do is you find out the dosage that I need to produce a consistent amount of testosterone in my system over a four to six month period. Right. Based on my weight, my size, my health conditions, mm -hmm. my exercise, my metabolism. Your heredity. I ask where your family's from. Because that so, tells so me something we, about So we have this conversation sites. the first time I come in. Mm -hmm. And you say, based on everything that mm -hmm. I'm seeing, I think this is the right dose mm -hmm. for you. Then you give it to me. I come in in six months, mm -hmm. and we have another conversation. As a male, you come in in six months. As a female, you come in in three and a half. So the, and then we have another conversation, mm -hmm. and, and what do you do then? Do you take another blood test? Do you just have a conversation with me about how are you feeling? Like you said, a month in, you were feeling you know, the system crash. Right, I mean, right, because, because of my genetics. And, and nowadays, I would kind of I would ask those questions and, and figure out who needed the, uh, the anastrozole mm -hmm. and who didn't. Right. Uh, and I wasn't doing it because of breast cancer. I was doing it because I wanted to feel normal. So that was my young normal was with less estrone. Yeah, there was in the article there was a discussion, and maybe it's worth referencing, uh, mm -hmm. about symptoms that people complained of when they were first put in uh, to consideration for this treatment. Mm -hmm. uh, they were they had fatigue, PMS, mm -hmm. um, hot flashes, sweating, migraine, sleep headaches. disturbance, yeah, depression, irritability, anxiety, premenstrual syndrome. Memory loss, migraine headaches, vaginal dryness, sexual problems, urinary problems. I mean, musculoskeletal pain. Yeah. And loss and bone loss. And so not just, they, not breast cancer. I mean, they were coming in for all these other things right. and got a measure that said your testosterone needs to be replaced. Mm -hmm. But then she wanted to take those people and put them in a study, the, the, the women in mm -hmm. particular, and say, what's the occurrence of breast cancer once you're on a testosterone implant? Mm -hmm. And so they tracked them for 167 
out of, well, they got results of 167 out of 100,000 person years. That's a formula calculation that they do. But the end result is out of 1,267 people, 11 got breast cancer. Right. And that was a 35% reduction but they expected of, 16 of what they expected. Or 18 to, be, to get right. it. So in the normal incidence of breast cancer in the same kind of population, the same age, the same uh, symptoms, the same menopausal status, they, they matched them, the control to that, and then they got a third less breast cancer. So the patients weren't coming in to prevent breast cancer. They were coming in because well, the classic they hormonal felt imbalances. terrible yes. in all those ways that we described, and they needed to be replaced with testosterone. And they got the benefit of having a lower incidence of breast cancer. And that's what we call serendipity. When they don't <laughs> expect a good thing to happen, or a bad thing to happen, but it does, mm -hmm. that is causative. And so D Dr. Glazer is making the distinction early in the study. Correlation doesn't mean causation. That's a constant issue that you have to be reminded about. Just because things happen similarly doesn't mean that one caused the other. I saw an example I have to use. Yeah. I, had, I, I was working out this morning, and I saw that somebody on television was saying, my hair all fell out because I had COVID. Uh -huh. Well, her hair all fell out and she had COVID. Whether that had anything to do with the COVID or not, we don't know enough to know. We yet. don't know. Right. It, it wasn't necessarily causative. Yeah. I mean, maybe later we'll find out it was, but but now all it just means is you had a big hair loss, maybe because of the fever. Yeah. Or maybe your thyroid tanked. Well, but and, it's not because of the COVID. And the necessarily. example that Dr. Glazer used in the original research that she was looking at, people were making the correlation that cancer and testosterone occurred in these women, so testosterone caused it. Now she's done the research and she says, we have too. data that says, no, that's not what happens. Right. So reduce your risk by 30%. That's a good option, I think. But and get rid of all your other symptoms at the same time. Yeah. Thank no you brainer. for listening. Email your questions or comments to podcast at biobalancehealth.com. You can find the Biobalance HealthCast on iTunes and on YouTube. For more information about bioidentical hormone pellet therapy and other reverse aging solutions, visit biobalancehealth.com or call 314-993-0963. You can find Dr. Maupin on Twitter at Dr. Kathy Maupin and on Facebook at facebook.com slash biobalancehealth. Find Brett Newcomb at brettnewcomb.com.